Hi there, and welcome to Context Free, where we talk about programming languages. Today, I want to talk about memory safety, and a little bit of other kinds of safety too. And I want to talk about it in C++, Zig, Rust, and C Sharp. And the sample problem for today is a tree of nodes, sort of like the DOM tree you have in your web browser, where each node has a pointer to children and a pointer up the tree so we can navigate the tree easily. Let's start in C++. And it's simplified beyond what you have in your browser. I do have the kids for each node and a parent pointer, but all I have for data on each node is just a string name. And to be lazy, instead of automatically maintaining the parents as nodes get added to or removed from a tree, I just initialize all the parents after the fact. Then I have a handy walk function that takes a callback action to work on each node. So I can print the tree or do arbitrary calculations like the total depth of the nodes. And yeah, I could have done this in a reduce or fold kind of fashion, but instead I just did it imperatively in languages today. Then I have an example processing application here where I build a tree, mess around with some of the members a bit, print the tree, do some calculations, and report. And I do these calculations a lot of times to represent arbitrary large amounts of processing going on in some kind of application. Down in main, I give some initial data to seed the tree with, and then I just run my processing. So let's see how this does. Oh, well, first of all, I've already got a problem. And actually, I've got a lot of potential memory errors running around this program here. But first, I thought I could take local variable, which is automatically cleaned up following C++ rules, and return a reference to it. And it's telling me I can't do that. Well, OK. Maybe I'll just work around that a little bit and get to my data through other means, using this pointer or reference into some kind of thing inside of the tree. Cool, it compiles and runs. And yes, I still have potential horrible memory things happening here, but the compiler doesn't notice it at this point. Note that I've used debug mode and lots of warnings in my compiler options so that I can get as much information out and make my program as safe as possible for whatever is built into the compiler by default here at least. Anyway though, we see the running of our program. Intro for this printout here, and then the full tree. Then we have a total depth of seven for each run through the tree, and 200,000 times gives us a total depth of 1.4 million. That's what we're seeing right here, and it looks like I don't have any errors at the moment. But let's look closer at how our data is being organized. I've passed in my initial intro node as a reference, returning a pointer to somewhere in the tree on the output. And also look here how I've made my kids a vector of expanded node structure values, not pointers to individual nodes separately allocated to memory. By having all my data together for the kids, I might make the memory cache work better, but it also means I have other things to watch out for, at least when I'm pointing to somewhere inside of those potential arrays. Anyway, down here, I returned this pointer to somewhere inside of the tree because what I passed in, though I received it by reference, it becomes a copy when I put it into this vector of expanded node children. And to make the point down here, I can try to print the parent name of this intro, which may have been set in here. But when you try this, I get a segmentation fault for accessing a null parent. Now, I didn't explicitly set it to null by default, but in debug mode, it's usually gonna be anyway. So there might be different kinds of bugs hiding depending on the amount of optimization you apply to your output. But for the moment, Clearly something bad happened. Instead of that, let's get our internal intro that got passed to us. That one presumably did get the parent set. And let's use that to see the parent name. Yep, the parent is root. Sweet. But this is a very bad thing that I've done. And how do we know that it's bad? Well, it's not obvious in the behavior right now, but I can make the behavior worse See, this is referencing memory that's located inside of this stack frame. And when the stack frame's immediately finished, well, the memory's mostly intact still. But if I call a new function, I'll mess up the memory. Let's see what happens now. That's definitely not what we want in our program. And this kind of arbitrary memory access is the kind of things you can build all kinds of security holes on top of. Sweet. But say I didn't have this here. How am I gonna know that there were memory problems in my program? Well. One of the options I have available is to run valgrind. Valgrind takes any executable and then runs it in a modified way such that it can try to look for memory problems or other kinds of things.
and it's very slow. And I purposely did this 200,000 loop just to emphasize that Valgrain is slow. So here we see that we're accessing memory below the stack pointer. So if we want to run everything inside of Valgrind, that can help us at runtime, say for example with our unit tests, to determine where we have memory problems so we can go and fix them. But as we saw, Valgrind is slow. An alternative might be to use sanitizers, which are handy inside of Clang and GCC these days with just a dash F sanitize equals address. So instead of Valgrind, let's do that. Here we see again that we have errors, only in this case it ran much faster. Well, let's get rid of this bad access and see what happens. Well, it's also one of them not using my variable. So let's get rid of that as well. And now the sanitizer does not recognize that I have a potential memory error because I'm not actually causing the memory error by not using this evil pointer. But let's see what other kinds of memory problems we can cause instead. Over here, I got this pointer to internal memory, and this is a pointer to somewhere directly inside of an array of structure values. And then I print the information I had there. What happens if I change that array in between getting the pointer and using it? Remember here, this is a pointer to inside an array of struct values. They're not independent pointers living separately in memory. When I add a new thing to my tree, it might reallocate that array and therefore leave this pointer invalid. Let's see what happens. And let's leave off sanitizers and Valgrind for now. Hmm, this does not seem right because I expect to see printing happen. So something bad happened in my program, but no obvious error about it. Let's try sanitizers back again. Yep, definitely had a problem. And if we get rid of this, the problem goes away. Now, the exact behavior of what happens when you mess up your memory is undefined. So someone else might have a different problem that happens based on the specific circumstances of the memory at that time, or subtle details in your program, or what the compiler does with it. Let's see what other kinds of problems we can make. Over here, I purposely looped over indices, and sometimes it's better just to do a for each loop because it's easier to get it right. But there are times we loop over indices or pointers, and I have a chance to make them wrong, such as, for example, my very simple less than or equal to the size right here. Let's see what happens if I run it now. Oh, segmentation fault. Now, I'm not guaranteed to get a segmentation fault, especially if I'm running, say, under optimized modes. This just does arbitrary memory access. If I want to be sure that my memory is being checked, I should use dot at instead of the square brackets, because this does bounds checking. And in the case of exceptions being enabled, I get an out of range exception. And worth pointing out, there's different kinds of problems that can happen in your program. Even if I get that right, what happens if I do the classic Thought I had a curly brace, but didn't, which is why a lot of people encourage always using curly braces. One nice thing about modern compilers is that when you ask for all the warnings, they can tell you that it's misleadingly indented. So that can save you from a different kind of bug that, who knows, might also have security problems someday if you do the wrong kind of thing that you thought you had inside of a loop. Meanwhile, back up here to this issue of whether the parent pointer is null or not, I could remember to make sure to initialize it to null pointer, or alternatively, I could use other things that make the status and the initialization much clearer, such as an optional reference wrapper to node. And I've left various commented lines of code throughout the program of how that would have to change my code elsewhere. Anyway, let's move on to Zig. And in Zig, we'll have some things similar to C++ and some things more like C. And without going into lots of details on the behavior in Zig, one thing to watch out for is that their current goal is that in debug mode, you get a lot of the same safety you might get from using sanitizers in C++. And they're partially along the way of getting there. And for example, if you look at the general purpose allocator in Zig, there's a lot of discussion here about when you're in debug mode, what kinds of problems it ought to detect for you at runtime. And this should apply to release safe mode as well, where some optimizations are turned on. We ought to have some amount of memory safety checking going on while you're running. So let's run this. And it seems to be working. What happens if for my optional parent pointer, I forget to initialize it to null? It warns me in this case. So we find there's also certain levels of static analysis that are a little bit stronger by default in Zig versus the G++ I was using. Another slight difference here, for example, in Zig is my square bracket access to arrays. Instead of choosing 
square brackets, or an at call. In Zig, you just access your array index, and in debugger safe modes, they'll be bounds checked, and in unsafe builds, just pure optimized, they'll be unchecked. So it's a different kind of way of deciding how that gets checked or not. And finally, one other quick thing to look at down here in Zig is that unlike the RAII, or resource acquisition is initialization of C++, where things get automatically reaped at the end of the scope, my memory needs explicitly deallocated in Zig. So if I return my tree here, I'm returning a full out node that still has allocated memory inside of it, if I should choose to do this. So down here inside of main, I could print the root here and it'd be safe because I haven't cleaned it up until after main is over. And actually, I could forget to clean it up entirely. But in this case, because I'm running in debug mode in Zig, it noticed that I had a memory leak, which Valgrind can do for you as well. This is just built into the general purpose allocator for debug builds in Zig. Though I also do want to point out that a memory leak is not the same thing as a memory access error, in the sense that memory leaks and also crashing don't give access to arbitrary locations in memory. Both the previous two, in my mind, are often much better than the latter. Though memory leaks can also still lead to low quality software, so it's nice that they have these checks in place. Let's move on to Rust. And Rust is different from what we just saw with a mixture of static and dynamic checking that we saw in C++ and Zig. Rust tries to move as much as possible to static analysis compile time. And because of that, you notice we actually don't have parent pointers here. And I'll get a little bit deeper into it later. Meanwhile, we can construct our leaves or parent nodes. We're not going to init our parent pointers because we don't have them. We can still walk a tree performing an action so that we can print a tree or calculate depths or whatever we want to do. And here we've built a tree, messed around with our internal data, print the tree, do some calculations, and so on. Let's run it. Sweet. Seems to work as we expect. But let's start trying to break things. First of all, let's see if we can return ourselves a reference to a node. And let's try to return that tree. Remember, we had an error with this in the compiler in C++, and we get it in Rust as well. We can't return a reference to local variable tree. Well, let's go a step further. Let's do the same cheat we had in C++. Let's return an internal pointer. Hmm. Can't return a value referencing local data tree.kids. Oh, it's owned by the current function. Hmm. We got it from our tree, and our tree is local, which means we can't return a reference into it. Foiled. So maybe we don't have anything to return here. At least no pointer slash references. We can deal with moves a different day. Meanwhile, let's see what other damage we can do. So here we have a pointer into our vector of nodes, and then we can print stuff after we get that reference. Let's try messing things up meanwhile between those two, just like we had in C++. Hmm, that didn't work. It says, cannot borrow tree.kids as mutable. The tree's not declared as mutable. Oh, okay, let's make it mutable then. Still an error. It says, cannot borrow tree.kids as mutable because it's also borrowed as immutable. Where? Right here, huh? Okay, well now it's mutable. Cannot borrow tree.kids as mutable more than once. Well, the gist is just that we're not going to be able to keep a reference into that data while we're messing it up. Rust saves us from that. But these kinds of static analysis things Rust can do also make it harder to do other kinds of things. Let's go look at those parents, for example. Aha, here we go. Well, because we have references, we have to worry about lifetimes. Well, that got fixed, but down here we need more. Lifetimes, lifetimes, everyone loves lifetimes. Hmm, maybe there, what's missing now? Aha, I still need to have a parent. So now this code is error free, although we still have a warning about the unused parent. So let's try to use it by initting our parents. Well, we got errors here too. Maybe we need more lifetimes. The error says lifetime may not live long enough. Well, let's add some lifetimes onto things then. Put one on here, which means we need to have something defined for the function. Now we got an error down here. We need an explicit lifetime. Okay, let's make an explicit lifetime. Still has an error. It says cannot borrow tree as immutable because also borrowed as mutable. This is sounding familiar from that last time. So let's try borrowing mutable here and see what happens. 
It says we can't borrow as mutable because it's not declared as mutable. Well, maybe this is what we need to do. And now we can't borrow as mutable more than once, which reminds us of the problem we had last time. And the gist is that it's hard to figure out what to do with cyclical references. Who outlives who? Who owns who? So it's not going to be possible for us to work it out in this way. And although unsafe might let us do some things, I'm just sticking to safe for us today. Another thing worth pointing out here is that Rust array accesses are bounds checked, but they can't statically check it with the language rules. They're going to dynamically check our memory accesses. So for example, if we go too far in our loop, interpreting it, or we have our warning about our unused parent node, we also get a panic for going outside array bounds, where again, panic or crash is not the same kind of memory safety problem as accessing bad memory. But what if we do want parent pointers in Rust? How do we go about that? Well, let's actually go back to C++ first. Or at least we will in part two of this video. Make sure to subscribe to catch it later, when we'll also talk about infinity lifetimes. Bye, y'all.